fantasy no one knows what it will be watch it grow watch it grow watch it grow watch it grow your small beginning hey y'all i'm so excited well maybe not excited but i am definitely knowing that this is a podcast that has been waiting to happen. And so today's the day. You know, I am a recent widow, and it's been five months since Wayman Lee Thurman has passed away. He passed away at age 81 on January 19th, 2020, from a blood clot in his lungs after open heart surgery. And we had been married and been together for nearly 35 years. We'd been together actually just three weeks shy of 35 years. Wayman was my rock, he was my joy, he was my strength, he was my best friend, he was my man. And I've been thinking about this podcast knowing that I needed to do it to give some helpful hints for those that are grieving and those that want to help others who are grieving. Y'all, I knew that I was supposed to be doing this podcast to share about my grief journey and to give some pointers for those that are in the middle of grief and those that want to help others in the middle of their grief. And so originally I thought, well, I'll give three points. And then I moved it to five. And then, y'all, it ends up being seven things that you can do to help those around you who are grieving and also to help yourself if you're in the middle of grief. So I'm excited to share this with you. Um, And excited is sort of a weird word to use when we're talking about grief. But yet I know this message is from my heart, and I know that God has helped me and been my strength. He says, Holy Spirit is the ultimate comforter. He has helped me. He has comforted me, and he continues to on this journey. So I'm not a licensed counselor. I'm just a grieving widow of five months. And those five months really seem like five years. So I hope my points today will bless you, will help you. And so I just want to say a prayer right now. (laughs) I say a lot of prayers all day long. So, Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this opportunity to share my heart in a true and honest and vulnerable way about my grief. And I pray that my message will be an encouragement to those that are grieving, for those that want to help others who are grieving. And I know I don't have all the answers. But I pray that what I have learned with these seven points will be a benefit and would bring you glory and would bring comfort from you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's the first one. Just show up. Just be there. Be present. I think the words to say, I'm so sorry, I'm here for you, cannot be understated. You have to really mean it, though. And you don't have to have an invitation to ring the doorbell. You don't have to have an invitation to bring dinner. You don't have to have an invitation to pick up the phone and call them. Because here's the deal, guys. Most of the time, we won't be answering the phone. We may, but just leave a message. It's okay. If you feel an urge to send a text, then do it. If God brings that person into your mind, then have some type of action to show that you care on the other side of that thought. A text message is awesome. Just say, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying about you. Hey, let me know if you need anything. I love you. I'm here for you. Whatever God leads you to in that text message and that way to reach out. So it seems 
like sometimes we feel like we need permission to just show up, but y'all, you really don't. You have to be brave here and just, and just show up. And if the toilets need cleaning, then clean the toilets. If the kitchen needs cleaning, then clean the kitchen. If the trash needs to be taken out, then take out the trash. Ask God to increase your awareness of how to bring comfort, how just to show up for people. It does take bravery on your part. I know that. But just reach out. Just show up. Y'all mow the grass. Ask your teenage son to come and mow the grass. Invite us over for dinner. It's so lonely in the evenings. You can ask them, hey, can I do errands with you? Especially at the beginning, like going to the bank. It's really hard. Going to the post office even. As simple as it sounds to go to the post office, that even in itself is hard. Number one, y'all, is just show up. But y'all, this kind of grief, like I'm talking about the grief as a widow, but I want you to know that we grieve about a lot of different things. So it doesn't have to necessarily be the death of someone. I'm hoping that some of these points could be useful for other areas of grief besides the actual death of a loved one. Number two, listen. Y'all, my favorite question for someone to ask me is, how are you doing, Sarah? But you need to listen to my answers. I don't want you to be rushed, and I do not want you to tell me your own story of grief at that time. Honestly, I can't hear it. I do not have the capacity to hear more grief stories at this time. And so this question, how are you doing, Sarah, is really a beautiful question. It's one of my favorite questions that people ask me. In fact, this week I've had two friends ask me, Sarah, how are you doing? How are you really doing? And they certainly wanted to know. They were all ears. They let me talk. And they really did want to know. So I feel loved when people ask me that, and I feel cared for when people ask me, how are you doing? And then listen to their answers. Number three, y'all, this is a really, really big one, and it's cry. I wrote in my notes here, cry, 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 cry. Tears are so important. And I didn't really realize how important they were. But as I started realizing how I felt after I cried for an extensive amount of time, how I felt calmer, I felt more rested, I felt more peace in my soul. And as I've done some research on tears, y'all, it's really, really cool. God put this mechanism in our bodies to shed tears. And there's three different kinds of tears. There's just the first, basal tears that lubricate our eyes. They're needed. The second type of tears are reflex tears. That's when we peel onions and that gas from the onions comes up and is an irritant to our eyes. Or we have dust or smoke in our eyes. Those are reflex tears. And the third type of tear is an emotional tear. And under the microscope, y'all, the dried tears of different emotions look differently. Well, the different kinds of tears look different under the microscope. But even dried tears from joy versus dried tears from grief look really different. God is so amazing in the way he created. I wanted to tell you some things that research have shown, and I have definitely experienced this before I even knew that there was research on the different types of tears. But there's three things that I can tell you that my tears and my cries have helped. Number one, they help me self-soothe. It actually activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps my body to rest and even digest. So when you cry, 
it activates this nervous system, the parasympathetic, that helps us move into a state of becoming more calm. The second thing that tears do is that they detoxify our body. It flushes out the toxins. And more research is definitely needed on this. But they know that the emotional tears contain oxytocin and endorphins, which both ease the physical and emotional pain. And the third thing that tears and crying can do for us, that it can improve our moods by bringing more oxygen to our brains. Because when we're crying and sobbing, we are bringing in more oxygen. Isn't that cool? So I think that it's so amazing for us to really allow ourselves to cry and how God made us to want to cry. And so that's another point that I want to say is don't hold back. There's been times in the last five months where I haven't been in a place where I felt safe to cry. And what I'm learning to do is to move myself into a safe place where I can cry. Sometimes I feel like, oh, this isn't a good place to cry. But y'all, I then move myself out of that situation and move to a place where I can cry. I will tell you one of my safest places to cry has been in the bathtub with an Epsom salts bath, which I also realize helps to Uh, calm my nervous system and bring relaxation. I never really knew that, but I was so like wanting to take baths. I usually, especially in the first three months, took at least two baths a day, sometimes more than that with my Epsom salts. It's so beautiful that he made us to be able to cry. So I just encourage you to cry. Every single person on earth has an innate ability to create. Hey y'all, I wanted to tell you about my e-course, 100 Days Creating with God. I believe it is the single most important course you can take. It's a great starting place. See, because I believe that you have to develop a daily discipline before you can move into the artist that God wants you to be. Now, some of you may be doing artistic work with paints, but others of you may be starting a flower garden. You also may be cleaning out drawers and getting organized, and that may be your place of creativity. God says He made us in His image, and He is the great creator, then we were made to create too. And so my e-course, 100 Days Creating with God, is a great start for you. It will help you to develop your daily discipline. First, you'll have some inner changes inside of you. You'll connect with God and His Holy Word in new ways. And then secondly, you will develop your skill set as a creative. I will set up the rhythms for you where you will be spending time with God every day for 100 days. It will change your life. So consider taking my e-course, 100 Days Creating with God. My fourth point is to exercise to the point of sweating. So here's the deal, y'all. We already are crying, so we might as well sweat through our pores. And I can tell you that I started going back to the gym. Wayman and I had started going to the gym and having very intensive workouts three days a week uh, about seven months before he passed away. And it was a favorite activity of ours. And we loved it. Um, I knew that I wanted to go back to the gym. And I did that really soon after Wayman passed. And a lot of times I would be sweating and working out and lifting my weights. And I have a trainer, Cameron, he's precious. And I would be crying. And he's like, are you okay? Are you okay? And I would say, yes, I'm okay. I'm just crying. I'm just really sad. He's like, well, we're going to work some more. And I would just work out even more. This routine of daily exercise, or at least exercising to the point of sweating, also clears out the toxins in your body and will just help you be in a better place of dealing with your grief. 
The fifth point I have is nature. God created so many beautiful things. And I really believe that maybe the exercise and the nature can go hand in hand to go for a walk every single day, maybe two walks a day. But going outside to connect with God and how he created, to plant a new garden, to plant a vegetable garden, to grow some herbs, to start bird watching, to notice new things in nature that maybe you've never seen before. Yesterday, I was sitting on my back porch, on my back deck at my home, and I noticed a gecko coming out of the umbrella on my table and doing his little breathing and then finally made his way over to the plants to start hunting, I guess, and getting food for the day. But I so enjoyed watching this gecko, the simplest of little lizards, green lizard, that I'm not afraid of. I don't want it crawling on me, but it just brought me peace, like he's going about his business. It was maybe about 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, and he had had his sleep, and now he was going to go gather his food. And so just noticing nature has brought me so much joy in the middle of my grief. The sixth point, y'all, is that know that firsts are hard. The first time you go to the store, the first time you go to the gym, to church, to dinner with friends when your man isn't there. I cried a few weeks ago when we were getting ready to go to dinner with my friends and two couples and me. And I cried before we went. And my friend Ann said, you're not the fifth wheel. I said, well, it sure looks like it. I'm the fifth person. She's like, no, you're not. You're welcome to go with us. We want you to go with us. And I know Wayman's not here, but you're welcome to come. And so I did. It's Those kind of things are hard. The first time you do something without the person that you're grieving, the Father's Day, the Mother's Day, the anniversaries, the birthdays, all of those are hard. And so sometimes you might want to ask, the friend you're trying to help, or the family member, hey, can I go with you? My son went with me to the first time when I went to work out, and then my daughter-in-law went the next time because I could not walk in that gym without someone holding my hand and like being right there with me. And then now I can go. It's not a problem, but at first it was so hard. The seventh point I have is be honest. Tell the pain talk about the pain, talk about the hurt, share your feelings, share the loneliness. Don't be afraid to say how much you're hurting. The people that care about you need to know how you're doing. And you need to reach out for help if you're sinking into darkness. You need to know the people that you can call or text and say, hey, I'm having a really bad day. Can you be praying for me? When I've done that, one of the friends will respond and say, hey, can you take a phone call right now? I want to call you. And they do. And we pray. And I get through that deep, deep grief that I'm right in the middle of. Another thing is when you establish some routines in this, and that's what I'm working on right now. So I guess maybe I have an eighth point here. I hadn't planned on having this, but I'm hearing it. Routines help a lot. And so as I prepare to move home this next week, and I've been gone for about eight weeks um, because of COVID, and I just wasn't, I was in so much grief being at my home that I needed to move locations. And so I went with my son and daughter-in-law for about Actually, I think I've been gone 12 weeks. So don't be afraid to say how much you're hurting. The people that care about you really need to know how you're doing. And you need to reach out for help if you're sinking into a deep, dark place. Because the people that care about you need to know that. And you need to reach out to them. Do not wait until you're sinking in such a deep hole that you're not going to get out by yourself. And so I know at times when I've been so lonely, I've just reached out with text and said, hey, I'm having a really bad day. Can you be praying for me? 
And most of the time, one of my friends will text back and say, hey, can you take a phone call right now? I'd like to call you and pray with you. And so that has been very helpful. The other thing, y'all, I've been honest to tell my friends that I'm moving back to Wimberley, that I'm going to need help. I said, this is going to be hard for me. And so I need you to include me. I need you to not forget about me. And that seems a little weird to do, but yet I know I need that. And I have to be honest and say, I don't want to sink into a hole where I cannot function because I know God wants me to keep functioning. And yes, in the middle of my grief, and I do sit and cry and I do, you know, contemplate and, and sit and rest But y'all, the coolest thing, when you think about Psalm 23 and what that Psalm says in the very middle of it, it says, you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death and my staff and my rod will be there to bring you comfort. But we are to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I will say to you, there have been times when I have been sitting, but I know God wants me to keep walking. And he wants you to help other people keep walking. So I hope my seven points, and I'm going to go back to through them very quickly. Number one, show up. Number two, listen. Number three, cry and allow your friend or your family member to cry. Number four, exercise to the point of sweating. Number five, go out in nature. Number six, Know that firsts are hard. It's hard to go to the, the first time for everything without the person that you love that's not here anymore. And number seven, be honest. Y'all, I hope this has helped you. This is what I want to do. I want to pray and just pray for those that are in grief and pray for those of you that hear this podcast that would be stirred to action by Holy Spirit to reach out in ways that you haven't been brave enough to do. Deep love requires deep comfort. God is good. So Lord, I thank you right now that you are the great comforter. Holy Spirit, you say that's your name, great comforter. So would you come and give revelation to those who are grieving, that you would show them how to walk through the valley of the shadow of death in new ways, where you're right there with them. Your grip is so tightly on us, we're not alone. And Lord, would you give revelation to those loved ones and friends who need to reach out and help in a way that maybe they haven't been brave enough before or hadn't even thought of. So I thank you, Lord. I want to tell you one last story of what happened in the afternoon before we were going to the funeral home for Wayman's visitation. My two sons and their wives were there and we were preparing to go. It was about two hours before we were going and we were all so sad. And a friend of mine, Cecilia, without calling and saying, hey, uh, do you need a fruit salad and some dark chocolate? No. Y'all, she showed up at our door with a huge bowl of fruit salad and dark chocolate. And I'm telling you, within 30 minutes, that fruit bowl was empty. And I'm not sure about the dark chocolate. I can't remember. But it was such a refreshing. And I know Holy Spirit told her, bring that fruit salad to the Thurman family. Y'all, I knew it was God just sending us a big old bowl of fruit (laughs) and brought refreshing to our souls and gave us energy to do the next thing. God is so good, y'all. And He is the great comforter. And He wants us to be comforted by Him. He sends us comfort in a variety of ways. And He also wants to use us to be the comfort, to be His comfort to others. So I pray this has blessed you. So I hope this is helpful. Would you 
Would you let me know if it is? I would really appreciate that. So as I end every episode, every one of my podcasts, Small Beginnings with Sarah, I ask the question my mama always asks, how good can God be?